Welcome to another episode of The Age of Science. In today's episode, we are going to talk about the origins of life. How did it start on Earth? Does it exist in other parts of our universe? And if it exists, what kind of forms it can take? Today's guest is Dr. Graham Lau from Blue Marble Space Institute of Sciences. He's a research scientist working on astrobiology. Glad to have you here, Graham. How are you doing today? Yeah, it's a pleasure to join you. Thanks for having me. I'm doing quite well. It's, we've had a lot of wildfires here uh, in the western part of the U.S. lately. And yesterday, it, in the town of Boulder, Colorado, where I live, it was inundated with smoke and ash. I mean, it was raining ash from the sky. And so it was a very weird day yesterday. Fortunately, it's, it's better today, but it's still fairly smoky. Wow. A typical 2020, right? It has been yeah, discussed with lots of things. One thing after another. We, we started off the year with some of the worst wildfires Australia has ever seen. We've been through now this pandemic, just shutting things down left and right. You know, now we have wildfires out here in the West, the huge hurricane season, uh, typhoon season. Uh, Pakistan got hit by a huge swarm of locusts that were just eating everything. Yeah, 2020 has been intense. <laughs> yeah, at the beginning, everybody thought the Australia's wildfires are going to be the defining moment of 2020. And now we're like, yeah. oh, sure. <laughs> like, yeah. Honestly, I, most people seem to have forgotten about the wildfires in Australia already. That's how terrible this has been. Yeah, exactly. And everybody's becoming super self-centered, being at home, not mm. too much of human interaction. It's just becoming a new world. Oh, yeah. But, you know, we, we also are going online more than ever. And as Peter Diamandis has said, this is democratizing the Internet. There's more voices and more perspective online than we've ever had before. More people are learning to use the Internet to connect. And I don't even like the term social distancing uh, because we're, we're not socially distancing, we're physically distancing. So I, I like saying that we're, we're physically distancing, but if anything, using the internet has actually made us more social with each other. It's forcing us to go online and to talk to other people online all the time. So I, I don't think we're actually all that socially distant. Yeah, exactly. Like in my meetings for in my day job, what happens is I see more people right now than before. Mm -hmm. In my Zoom meetings or Teams meetings, everybody has cameras on. They're excited to talk about stuff because kind of, you know, they, 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 they try not to lose the human touch. And exactly. that has been amazing. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been giving public talks for a long time. I love speaking about science and, and various other topics. And usually when I have an audience inside, like, you know, an auditorium or a lecture room, you know, maybe I have 50 people, maybe I have 200 people that I'm speaking to. But, you know, with, with the internet now, I, I can give much larger talks. I gave a talk a few months back uh, for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and there were, I think, 1,200 uh, separate Zoom accounts signed in watching my talk. And many of those were like, you know, families of three or four or five people. And so there might have been 4,000 people watching that talk. There, there's no way I'm going to fill a small auditorium with, you know, 4,000 people. And so it's definitely, it's definitely changed the kind of audiences that I see online, too. Yeah, that's amazing to see also people started caring more about science and scientific community because that's what's saving them right now. That's what they, you know, kind of they see that they, the governments didn't spend too much on science and that's what we see we are getting hurt by it. And now everybody's aware of that and I hope they will be aware of that forever after this because, you know, vaccines and everything are expensive and scientists who are doing it are actually working on very, they don't do it for money but they need to live, live too, right? So that's what I'm trying to say. People are getting more aware that, oh, we need to support scientists more than before, right? Well, hopefully so. <laughs> and, and I hope hopefully. they don't forget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I know from your background, you've been working on astrobiology and you're very uh, curious about life in other parts of the universe, not just on earth. So I just want to write down into it, go and ask, what have you been working on during the past couple of years? Yeah, so my, my research, my, my research side of my work is in geochemistry and mineralogy, trying to understand how we can find signs of life on other worlds in our solar system and beyond. And for, for my own personal research, I've been looking at this really cool place up in the high Arctic in Canada uh, called Borup Fjord Pass. Uh, it's a valley on Ellesmere Island, and in the middle of this valley, there's this glacier. And at the very toe of the glacier, on the southern side of the glacier, at the toe of it, are these springs of water that come up from the subsurface, uh, sometimes through the glacier, sometimes at the base of the glacier, and they bring out a bunch of fluid that's really rich in sulfide. Uh, it creates that smell like rotten eggs. 
Uh, and when that, when that sulfide meets the air, oxygen in the air can mix with the sulfide and, and turn it into elemental sulfur, uh, which is a really pretty yellow mineral. Uh, and so uh, we've been studying this site to try to understand uh, the processes that bring this fluid up, and then what's happening at the surface with the transition into sulfur, uh, what kinds of microorganisms, for instance, are thriving in this environment and how they're using the sulfur, and whether or not we can use this as a test bed for looking for signs of life in other worlds, places like you know, Mars or Europa or Enceladus. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, it's, it's really fun research because it makes you think a lot more you know, about not just the single system itself, but also about systems outside of that and how it really applies to our understanding of life elsewhere. Uh, I've also been spending a lot of personal time thinking about things like techno signatures, how we might find signs of intelligent life in the universe. Um, and I've also been spending a lot of time researching science communication, how to share science and how to share these ideas with other people. Uh, and so I kind of have my, my hands in a whole bunch of different pots right now. Oh, um, that's amazing to hear. So let's, let's start from the beginning, get go. Like wh what, how do we define something is alive or <laughs> it, it's just, it has life, right? What separates a being from something that's not actually existing as a being or yeah. doesn't have any understanding of the surrounding? Yeah, Kurt, it's weird. So, you know, right now we have, we have that feeling that, you know, if, if you see something living, you can say, oh, that's, that's, that's alive um, or not alive. It's, it's the, I, I know when I see it kind of idea. But when it comes to the actual definition of life, there isn't one. Um, there's actually several hundred attempts to define life uh, if you look online, you might find one right now called the NASA definition. Um, and that is that, that life is a self-contained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Uh, so basically it's saying that life has to be contained somehow. So we have cells, for instance. Uh, it has to be a chemical system. So it has to be composed of, of chemical materials. Um, and the big clincher is that it has to undergo Darwinian evolution for us to say it's life. Uh, but there are so many problems with, it, with that, that, that definition itself. Uh, for instance, Darwinian evolution doesn't apply to a single individual. And so that definition by itself says that single individuals can't be alive. And you and I are sitting here right now talking and being alive. And so that by itself breaks down automatically. Uh, there are also, you know, certain kinds of organisms that can't reproduce. And so they can't evolve. You know, there, there are mules, for instance, and other sterile uh, uh, beings that can't reproduce. And so they can't evolve. Uh, so that's a problem. And then the current definitions don't even help us when we try to figure out whether or not artificial intelligence or, uh, as some might say, post-biological life, uh, it, whether that be living or not. And so there's so many issues right now. We really haven't nailed it down to a single definition. And some people out there, like the philosopher Carol Cleelan, have argued that we really can't define life, that, that life isn't the kind of uh, idea that, that bears definition. Instead, it's more about characterizing the realm of life. Uh, however, for someone like myself being an astrobiologist, I think that what we really, really need to do is find other examples of life. Exactly. We only have one example right now. We have one biosphere that we know of where life exists in the entire universe. And if we find another form of life, a form of alien life, it's going to finally let us do something called comparative biology. Uh, so we, we can do comparative biology with different kinds of species and organisms here on Earth, but if we actually had another biosphere to look at, that would really let us start figuring out more about what life is and what life isn't. So since we know, yeah, exactly. The definition is not clear. We don't know. And actually defining it would be a mistake, like, you know, have a rigid definition because it's going to limit our view of what to look for when you're looking out there. You know, one just for listeners, when you have one point, you're not going to fit a line to it. There's no way you can put a line and say, hey, it's going to continue this way. And I can guess other parts of the universe is going to follow Darwinian evolution. That's what we have seen so far. So just, just to get to a more complex discussion, I want to start with a bit simpler than you know, what, what we were talking about now. How did it start on Earth? Because there are so many, again, there, there is lots of theories that will say, oh, it started from, by chance, on a RNA started, you know, and evolving to DNA and all the way to us. Or it was an asteroid that came from outside of the Earth and brought it in, you know, that complex organism that started evolving to become us. So what do you think about it, Graham? Like, yeah, um, so again, just like with life, we actually don't know. Uh, and I, li I like to tell people that, 
chances are the only way we're ever really going to know how life started on Earth is if there was an intelligent alien race out there watching it happen and they could later tell us what happened. Because when it comes down to it, uh, we don't have that kind of information preserved in a rock record and a fossil record because the earliest life on Earth most likely was very soft, wet, chemical life that didn't leave behind any kind of micro fossils for us to see. But even then, we can still kind of look at, you know, the ancient geological record. We can get an idea of potential processes that might have been occurring for early living organisms. Um, and there are some who think we might, we might be able to find some of those earliest things that were happening that life was doing. Uh, we do know that life probably started on Earth pretty early in Earth's history. Uh, we have pretty good evidence of life to about 3.8 billion years ago. We have really good evidence of life, you know, about 3.6, 3.5, 3.2 billion years ago. So definitely, you know, more than 3 billion years. But a lot of us think that life might have been on Earth as much as 4 billion years ago. Uh, it might have happened pretty early to this planet that, that living processes started happening. Uh, but you're right, there, there's, there, there's these issues, right? We don't know if life actually started here or if it was brought here. So uh, let's talk about that first. Uh, that's an idea called panspermia. Uh, first proposed by the Greek Anaxagoras. Uh, this idea of panspermia, the word, the word basically means seeds everywhere. And it's the idea that life could be transmitted between planetary bodies. And so maybe life in our, in our solar system, maybe life started first on Mars, uh, or probably more likely, maybe life started on Venus. Uh, maybe there was a biosphere on Venus, and early impacts of rocks crashing into Venus blew some other material off the surface, which then traveled through space and came here to Earth, and then you know, seeded life here on our planet. Uh, and that's entirely possible. There have been a, a lot of, there's been a lot of great research into this realm of could life sur survive the impacting process? Uh, and we know, yeah, there's actually areas of spallation where material is being blown off the surface of a planet during an impact uh, where, where living things could survive intact inside of those rocks. Um, people have looked at to whether or not life could survive the transmission through space. Um, and it seems like as long as life was, you know, well preserved inside of some rock, uh, it, it likely could survive that transit. Uh, even with all the radiation, cosmic bombardment and stuff like that, it still could survive that process of being transmitted from one planet to another um, and potentially even from one star system to another. Um, it, seems, it seems possible uh, and then could be seeded elsewhere. So the idea of panspermia is very cool. Uh, it's unfortunately not very testable yet uh, because even if, even if you know, we, we, we start learning more about how life started here on Earth, we won't know whether or not life was brought here from elsewhere unless we find life somewhere else. Exactly. Uh, so if we find life on Mars, and I was actually having a conversation just this past Saturday night for uh, the show Space Spam, uh, hosted by my friend Ron Sparkman uh, for OPT Telescopes. And we were basically ta talking about whether or not we could find DNA on Mars. Uh, and the thing is, it's probably not likely that we'll find DNA on Mars, but we might. Uh, and what would happen if we do? So uh, it would mean two things. One, it could mean that DNA actually is a convergent molecule, that life converges to using DNA uh, as an information storage molecule. That's possible. Um, even though there's a lot of other potential ways that life could store information and use that to code uh, its building blocks and to evolve. Uh, but if we find DNA that's not only you know, DNA, but also very similar to our own, that uses the same four base pairs, for instance, to code its information, that maybe uses the same kind of molecular machinery to read that DNA. Um, then what we, what we might have then, uh, as long as it's not contamination from our spacecraft, uh, what that could mean is that life on Mars uh, had a similar beginning to life on Earth, and either life was taken to Mars from Earth or taken from Mars to Earth. Uh, and that could be pretty interesting to find. Yeah. And so that, that'd be really the only way for us to really confirm this idea of panspermia currently. Yeah, so the other idea is, no, it just started on Earth and, uh, you know, by some chance started a complex system that started evolving to get to us. Now, in order to test some of these theories, right, to see like if life can preserve in a very, very, I don't know, high temperature environment, high pressure environment. So that is where I think most of the research on Earth is, you know, actually going toward. 
digging into the down into the ocean all the way to the very deep parts or go to the glacier life. Yeah, only somewhat though. So, so there's also other research. Um, so one, we really don't know yet when continents first started on the earth. Um, so, so we have oceans and we have crust down below the oceans, the, the, the oceanic crust. And we don't really know exactly though when continents started forming. The earliest continents would have been much smaller than they are now. Uh, and the continents, as we know them on our planet, would have slowly been building up more and more over time to, to get to the, be, the, be as large as they are now. But the early continental crust might have been very rare. Uh, and so people have been trying to figure out now when did continents start? And uh, there's also other people who think we might have actually had to have dry land in order for life to begin. Um, so for instance, you know, maybe, maybe life started by hydrothermal vents in the bottom of the ocean, but there are other people who think that we actually need like drying, like wetting and drying cycles for life to occur. Uh, so so a, a recent hypothesis from uh, Dave Deemer and Bruce Damer uh, has proposed that life actually started uh, in in, uh, in uh, hot spring systems at the surface on continents here on Earth, and it required you know wetting and drying cycles for the molecules to come together in the right way for life to start, and so that by itself is another idea. We actually don't know. Maybe life started at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe it started at the surface. Maybe it required a hot environment, or maybe it required an environment that had kind of changing uh, changing parameters. So wetting and drying and cold and hot. Um, and we just, we just don't know. So this gets me to a question I want to ask. You, know, I, you told me that you worked on Arctic glacier ice, right? I just want to know why, why were you interested in that? Is there a connection between that glacier ice research and one of these theories? So for the origins of life, not so much. So, so we're not really looking at glaciers as being a likely place for life to have emerged. And I would never say it's impossible. For instance, glaciers do a lot of really cool things. Glaciers scour the rock and they, they, they kind of break rock down and they create, you know, an area of nice exposed fresh rock, which that by itself might be important for the origins of life in some worlds. What we studied this, this glacier for is one, to better understand these, these uh, biological and chemical processes that are occurring in this cold, uh, actually dry, it's, it's, it's technically a polar desert uh, environment with a spring system that's rich in sulfur. Uh, so this, this ecosystem, this environment that we study is, is a sulfur dominated system. There's so much sulfur uh, chemically in the system that it gives us a chance to study the, you know, sulfur rich you know, processes that occur in sulfur chemistry. Um, and it's also a good test bed for trying to understand uh, processes that occur below the ice of a glacier as well as on the surface. And what's important for that is looking at worlds like Europa and Enceladus in our solar system. They have these oceans down below their icy crust. And one thing that we need to know if we're going to try to look for life there is, uh, is there any communication uh, geologically or chemically between the surface and down in that ocean? Uh, so if there is life, for instance, in Europa's ocean, uh, are any of the signs of that life now being taken up to the surface for us to find? And a good way to figure that out is to study places on Earth where fluids travel through things like glaciers. Uh, and so it's a really good test bed for that kind of science. Sure. And then there, there are also other types of studies if you're going to a glacier, like very, very thick ice. As you go layer by layer down, you start you know, going back to the history, right? There may be some signs of trapped kind of organisms frozen there. And... How, how about that? What kind of thing? Because it can help you to put pieces of the puzzles together, right? For the origin of the life also. That these are all pieces of the puzzles that when they, you know, you look at them from far distance, they can give you a better understanding of what, what possibly, you know, gave us life on Earth. Yeah, I mean, so, so our world has been through a lot, of, a lot of hot and cold cycles itself. We've had moments where much of the planet, you know, had, had ice, had ice sheets on top of it. We've also been through other moments where the world was, our world was very hot. And so if we dig down into the deepest ice on our planet, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to go back to the beginning. Uh, so that we don't have ice as old as the earth. Um, we don't have ice anywhere near that old. Uh, and so, and we also actually don't have very deep ice either, unfortunately. Uh, so for us to like, you might've heard about like trying to drill through the ice on Europa. A lot of us think the ice on Europa might be as much as 10 kilometers or even more in thickness. 
uh, so maybe maybe over six miles thick. And we don't have any ice on Earth that thick. And so for us to learn how to drill through ice that's you know six miles plus in thickness, when we don't have ice that thick on Earth, that, that's by itself going to be a huge technological uh, achievement. Um, but you're right, though. We, we do actually have a lot of important information stored in the ice on our planet. Uh, digging down to the ice, drilling down to the ice, and, and using what we call ice cores, uh, these long sections of ice, they've allowed us to learn a lot about the history of our planet, um, from the changing climate to the different kinds of pollens that we can find, can tell us about the kinds of plants that were around and prevalent at the surface. Uh, there's a lot of geochemical information stored inside of the ice that kind of acts like a, a record for us, the same way that the rock record, that digging down through the rock you know, tells us about the history of our planet, uh, drilling down through ice can also teach us a lot about the history of our world. So, yeah, because by studying the very exotic environments, we also get to understand also the changes in the environment, what impacts they can have on the life cycle of like a species living there. So that gets me to next question is because we talk about ages a lot. I just want to make, you know, for the audience to understand how do we measure actually, you know, the age of things when we dig in somewhere and we find a fossil, we say, Oh, this is like 3 billion years old or something like that. So maybe it would be interesting for them to know how do we get to measure them? Yeah. Guess it. Yeah, so, so in a, in a very general way, there, there are two things we can do to understand how old something is. Um, we can use a relative age or we can use an absolute age. Uh, so the first one, a relative age, uh, is like looking at something. So if I have a pile of books on my desk, uh, I know that there's a good chance that the book on the lowest part of the pile was put down first. And then the book on the very top of the pile is the very last book that I put on top of it. And that's, that's all relative aging. I, I can look at it and I can have a sense of that, that relative aging because of their positions. The, the lowest book is probably the oldest and the one that's above it is probably the newest. Uh, we do the same thing in the rock record. So we, we look at, at, at uh, strata. Uh, those are the different layers uh, of sedimentary rocks, for instance, on our planet. Uh, if we're looking in sediments, um, we can say that you know, the one that's lowest down is the oldest and the one on top of that is younger. Uh, if you're an archeologist and you're digging up some artifacts uh, there's a good chance the very first artifacts you find are far younger than the ones that are, are buried much further down. Uh, and so that's all relative aging. Um, and then the other one is absolute aging. And this is where we, we use chemistry and physics uh, and what we know about our, our radiation, our radioactive decay. Uh, so we, we use radioactive materials to date uh, very old things um, and, even, and even, even some younger things too. Uh, so right now, uh, all day, cosmic rays are striking atoms of nitrogen in our atmosphere and turning that nitrogen into carbon-14. That carbon-14 mixes in our atmosphere with oxygen uh, and makes carbon dioxide. It gets into the rocks around us. It gets into our food around us. And we're, we're constantly taking in th this carbon-14 in various ways. It's mixed into our bodies. And uh, it's co constantly being replenished with living things. But when we die we're not being replenished by new carbon-14 from our atmosphere. And so that carbon-14 is slowly decaying through radioactive decay. And we can actually measure that decay uh, and figure out how old something is by that, which is basically how we date really old artifacts. Uh, it's how we date old trees um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, so we, we use things like carbon dating like that to figure out the ages of young things. And we can actually use carbon dating to date things that are about 50,000 years old or younger. Uh, it's even been used for things close to 100,000 years old uh, in that range. But then it starts to break down because uh, the decay of carbon-14 happens rather quickly uh, in geological terms. And so it's not really good for dating very old things. For those things, we use things like uranium uh, and other radioactive elements uh, that, have, uh, that, that are persistent for much longer. Uh, the half-life of uranium-238, uh, for instance, is, is quite old. Uh, and 235 as well. Uh, and we, so we can use uranium uh, radioactive decay to date very old rocks on our planet and figure out how old they are. And then we actually will use a mixture of that with relative dating to, for other kinds of ages. For instance, uh, when you hear the dates of, of worlds in our solar system, say like you, you hear like the, the date of some geological feature on the surface of Mars, uh, that date isn't based on absolute dating directly. What it's based on is absolute dating uh, of rocks from the moon 
that have then been used to figure out the relative ages of craters on the moon, which has then been abstracted to trying to figure out the relative ages of craters on Mars, which is then used to date the surface of Mars. And so there's a, there's a lot of, of you know, uh, uh, things that we have to do to try to figure out these relative ages of things on Mars. Uh, we actually only have one good date so far, one absolute age from Mars. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so we, we use a mixture of those things in the planetary sciences as well to try to figure out how old things are. Yeah, and the reason we do that is because we want to put the puzzles in a historical format and see how, you know, kind of play the movie backward and try to guess, right? That's, that's I yeah, think, one of the biggest reasons. As much as we can, yeah. It, it's, those ages help us, you know, and we're always refining our ages once we get better and better techniques. Uh, better instrumentation that can give us better measurements. Uh, it helps us to refine our ages and, and take off the error um, a little bit and, and get down to a better age uh, using th this radioactive decay. Um, but it's basically how we start dating things. It also helps us to have a rough idea of, of what processes were occurring at what times on our planet through its history. That's awesome. Now, since we, we just started on the life questions, now I wanna get to a very crazy question. Do you think we are alone? Like, <laughs> on, on the, because it's just, I ask it from everyone, but what is your opinion? So first off, as a scientist, I have to admit that we might be alone. And when, whenever I hear someone say that like, we can't be alone, there has to be alien life out there, it's unfortunate because they're not really thinking very logically. Because if you apply logic to the situation, then we have to admit that we could be alone. Maybe, maybe we are the only life. And that by itself is actually would, would, would be really important for us to know because if, if our biosphere is the only biosphere, then we really almost have a universal duty to protect this biosphere and to propagate and spread life further. Um, the same way that we feel, you know, the, the, this, this desire to have children and to, to replicate ourselves to continue life forward. Life wants to continue forward. And so if we're the only life, we, 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 should, we should actually be getting out there and, and, and settling in other worlds and spreading life further out uh, because, you know, we need to protect it. Uh, but as a human being um, and as someone who dreams and thinks about possibilities a lot, I feel like we can't be alone. So even though we could be, and we have to admit that, it feels like there, there must be something else out there. When you start just thinking about the numbers, the sheer numbers of worlds that exist in our galaxy alone, uh, we, we've now confirmed the existence of over 4,000 exoplanets in a very, very small region of space, very close to our solar system. When we take the number of worlds we've found around stars so far and, and use that to, to kind of speculate the number that should be in our galaxy, then we start getting some really big numbers. It could be 600 billion or a trillion planets. It's a very big number of planets we likely have in this galaxy. And it feels like with that many planets, there must be some other planets that have had life happen to them as well. And so even though I admit that we might be alone, I feel like we're probably not. And that's part of why I, I think it's even more important to get out there and start looking. Uh, it's also part of why we, start, we, we really need to start having more conversations about whether or not we should be announcing our presence to other life that's out there just yet. Yeah, so as myself, I actually think, yeah, the probability of us being alone is very low, right? If you look at it from the sheer numbers, and if you when you put like very pessimistically one over billion, there is the life starts evolving. And since we have only one data point, I think we can weigh more weights toward not being alone. But still, as you're right, as a scientist, we never know. Maybe that very small possibility of being alone can be correct, which we hope not. Now, how do we look for it out there? Because the thing is, we don't, the, the problem I, I always have is we only have one data point and trying to only look for that. It's kind of a bit looks naive for me. If we are looking for only carbon-based life, let's say, or whatever we know of as a life system. So what, what, what do you think about it? How do we look for it? And do you think we can have better ways to look for it out there? Yeah, so there, there's a lot that we're doing right now in trying to find life out there. Uh, I'm part of a new research coordination network for the NASA Astrobiology Program. Uh, this RCN, as they're called, uh, it's called ENFOLD, or the Network for Life Detection. And it's bringing together a bunch of the scientists in this realm of life detection. 
uh, how do we actually detect life elsewhere? And what kinds of tools can we use? And even though, yes, we are very much looking for life as we know it, uh, because that's the easiest way for us to approach the problem, there are also a lot of us who have considered, you know, life as we don't know it uh, and how we can look for that. There's also a group uh, who, are, who are specifically targeting agnostic biosignatures. Uh, those are, are signs of life that are uh, not based on, on solely on life as we know it. So trying to use just the chemistry, just the physics, what kinds of signs of life can we find uh, whether or not it's life like earth life? Uh, earth life. And so there's a lot that we're doing, but uh, unfortunately when it comes down to it, you know, like finding water, finding carbon-based, you know, organic life as we know it is just easier right now because we have a lot more practice with that kind of life because it's the only kind of life we know. And so, you know, you, you hear people talking about, you know, looking for life on exoplanets and they're often talking about trying to find exoplanets that are in the Goldilocks zone for liquid water around their stars. And the only reason for that is, is because that seems like a place where we might find some life. But maybe that's wrong. Um, maybe life is actually more likely to occur in oceans of icy worlds like Europa and, and Enceladus. And so maybe the, the real place where we're far more likely to find lots of life in, in the universe is around gas giants much further away from their stars that have large icy moons. And, and we just don't know yet. And so right now we're kind of just, we're looking right now in the places we, we think to expect life, but we could be wrong. So we are um, starting so, from something we're familiar with just to build, you know, I mean, kind of prove that life exists, then we can move on and saying what other forms can exist, right? Now- Yes, yes and no. Like I, like I said, there are a lot of people who are considering agnostic biosignatures, mm -hmm. these other forms of life. And so, you know, with, so for instance, with Viking, uh, the Viking landers to Mars uh, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, these missions um, were, were looking for life. They had life detection built into them, but the kind of life they were looking for was very specifically life as we know it. They were looking for life that eats organic molecules and respires carbon dioxide, uh, or they were looking for life that breathes in carbon dioxide to create its own biological molecules, which is you know, our two processes that life on Earth does. And we know it, um, you know, and, and the only real instrument that was looking for just general organic molecules uh, was their GCMS, their gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Um, but now when we're going to Mars, we're not just considering just life as we know it, we are considering the potential for other forms of life. And so I, I would argue that a lot of people, even though we're looking for, you know, you know water worlds around exoplanet, uh, uh, around other stars for exoplanets and stuff like that, I still think we are doing a much better job now than we were in the 70s of trying to look for life as we don't know it, even if finding that life is very difficult. So what, uh, just follow up question for my curiosity, what types of other lives they are looking for, for example, the other missions that are not, you know, what we are familiar with? Absolutely, so a good one is, and you've probably heard this a lot before, not just in science fiction, but in science is the idea of silicon-based life. Uh, so we talk a lot about carbon-based life. Carbon is a wonderful molecule for organic molecules for building life because carbon atoms can come together and make these very long chained carbon-based molecules and, they can, and carbon atoms can interact with so many other atoms to make a lot of functional groups on these organic molecules. And so organic molecules, simply put, are molecules that have carbon uh, bonded to other atoms um, besides methane and carbon dioxide. Uh, so methane and carbon dioxide are, are considered uh, abiotic or non-biological carbon molecules uh, or non-organic carbon molecules. And then every other carbon-based molecule is an organic molecule. And there's a lot of these out there. But silicon is very similar to carbon uh, chemically. Uh, so if you look at the periodic table, silicon is just below carbon. And that means they have similar properties. So silicon can also make uh, long molecules with silicon backbones. Uh, and we also are now using a lot more silicon for like computer chips and things like that. And there's a chance that we'll even end up creating our own artificial life that has silicon as its backbone. Um, however, there's a lot of reasons to think that silicon could be bad as well. Uh, for instance, those silicon to silicon bonds, uh, they're not as strong as the carbon to carbon bonds. And so they actually break a little bit differently than the carbon carbon bonds do and might not actually be a very good bond to have for life. 
Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons to think that, that silicon-based life might not happen. Um, also, silicon is very prevalent in the Earth's crust. We have lots of it, uh, and, but we don't have any great examples of silicon-based life happening here that we know of yet. Uh, we do have things like diatoms that use silicon to make a glassy shell called a frustule around their cells, but we don't have any examples of silicon-based life yet that we know of, uh, which might tell us that it's not as likely out there. But people are still looking for it. And, and if we find a bunch of silicon, especially weird silicon molecules that appear to be uh, doing things uh, enzymatically, catalyzing reactions, that'd be pretty cool to find. Um, you know, so we're definitely looking for that. There are people who are considering you know, what, kinds of, what kinds of indicators of life could we find that are you know, generic signs of life? If we look at the atmosphere, for instance, of an exoplanet, what kinds of molecules could we find and what proportions uh, would indicate some biological process to us? And so there's a lot of folks out there right now who are considering this, you know, with, especially with upcoming generations of space telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope or a new one that's in the works called Lavoir, which a lot of us hope gets funded and gets, gets sent to space. Um, you know, what kinds of signs of, of alien life could we find in these atmospheres that don't necessarily have to be just life as we know it? So the next question I want to ask for the listeners to understand, how do we actually, when we look at the exoplanets, let's say, how do we start candidating them? You know, say this is a candidate for possible you know, having life in it, because we didn't talk about it. I just wanted us to talk about it a bit. Yeah. So again, a lot of people think that, that a world has to have a surface ocean to have life. And so they, they look for, they're looking for Earth-like rocky worlds, terrestrial worlds, in this region called the Goldilocks zone around stars where liquid water can exist at the surface. But as I personally mentioned, I think that could be wrong. Um, you know, so one thing I, I loved in the original Cosmos series with Carl Sagan was this really beautiful scene where he goes a little speculative. And he speculates, what if life could start in the atmosphere of a gas giant world? What would that look like? And so he proposes that beings like these floating beings and these other beings that kind of have their very large wings and they're flying around and creating their own biosphere. Maybe that's entirely possible. We don't know yet. And so maybe we'll find that, that most life out there, once we find it, is actually dwelling inside of the atmospheres of giant worlds like, like Jupiter and Saturn and these even larger gas giants around other stars. And so maybe we should be looking there and seeing if we're finding any weird variations in the chemistry. Um, and even, you know, when we do get much better telescopes, we can start resolving uh, some of these exoplanets, which, you know, we're not there yet, but eventually we will be. Um, maybe we'll actually see something weird, like the migrations of organisms around these atmospheres. It'd be very difficult to tell the difference from that and other cloud formations, but it could be an interesting signature of life for us to start finding. And so uh, while we are looking for Earth-like worlds that could have oceans at their surfaces, I think there's a lot of scientists out there who are also aware that there could be life in all these other worlds we're finding as well. And so it's, it's good for us to keep our minds open about what's possible. Now, when we get here, I want to ask this question from you. We, we talked about like they can look weird, look, weird looking aliens for us because you know, for us, it's going to look weird. For, for them, we will look weird. So... What type of alien life do you expect to exist? Like, we don't know yet, but we can imagine from base of the things we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Because um, there's so much we don't know without having any other signs of life, any other data points to work from. But one thing we, one thing we're, we're, we, we know happened on Earth is that life was cellular. Life was, was, was single-celled on Earth for a very, very long time. We didn't start becoming larger multi-celled beings for a very long time on Earth. Um, and so maybe that happens elsewhere. Maybe it takes life a long time in general to start building larger multi-celled organisms, if at all. And so maybe most of the life that we'll find on other worlds will be microbial life. Um, but maybe life also becomes you know, far more you know, large, complex, multi-celled organisms Maybe that happens a lot faster, and so maybe that, that's a wrong opinion. Um, we really need more examples of things to find. Um, it'd be really hard for us to find life if it's not doing something. So we would hope that, so like, you know, life on Earth, it, it catalyzes reactions. You know, we, we catalyze reactions, we make reactions go forward. We would hope that alien life would do this, a similar thing in a fast enough time for us to see it. 
But what if there is life out there that's really, really, really slow at catalyzing reactions, uh, so slow that it's just barely faster than it would happen naturally? It might be difficult for us to know that's life um, because we, we need life to be doing something really to, to, to see that. Um, so that's something that we can kind of look for is for life to be catalyzing reactions, uh, making reactions move forward uh, faster than they would naturally. Uh, there's other things we could be looking for though. So say, say there, there are alien beings that have developed uh, multi-celled creatures just like us. Um, maybe not with the same kinds of you know, animals and plants as we have them, but maybe we could look for things like uh, the same kinds of features like ways to get around, fins, legs, uh, ways to move through the air like wings. Uh, and so we might find some convergent evolution creating similar structures to what we have. Uh, we use perception to see the environment around us, to feel the environment around us so that we can react to it. And so maybe alien life will have similar appendages for receiving light like eyes uh, or for feeling the vibrations of sound uh, in the air around, around them. So maybe they'll have some kind of ear-like appendages. Um, we just don't know though because we need to find these other signs of life. Um, so may maybe life will be very wildly different uh, I, for one, wonder, you know, will we find life that isn't cellu cellular? Maybe life will have come upon some different way of harnessing uh, a, a contained structure. Maybe it would be much larger than the cells that we know. And so there, there's a lot of possibility. And so I, I don't ever want to say, like, this is what alien life will look like. Rather, I'd like to say, you know, we don't know, so what do you think? I mean, because there, there's so much possibility. Uh, there's a lecture that I give called The Craziest Creatures on Earth, where I, I talk about some of the weird things biology has done on Earth alone. There are some really bizarre creatures on our planet for us to look at uh, to give us some weird examples of, of what life does here. And those examples by themselves tell us, tell us that maybe alien life itself will be just really, really bizarre. Yeah. So now I just want to follow up on this. If there is another way of looking at life, because they can... If there are intelligent beings out there, let's just put it, the definition a bit naive in one sentence. If they are intelligent and they got to the communicative level in their intelligence journey, they will have some signs that we can look for, right? Like radio signals or bizarre objects traveling like our satellites around Earth. And they, when they pass through, you know, in front of the star, as an astronomer, you can look and see the dimmings are not natural, you know, for a normal planet. They have a kind of periodic behavior, for example. What do you think about those? What kind of things do you think we can look for in that sense? Yeah, so first off, uh, so now we have a whole new name for this. Uh, we call it technosignatures. Uh, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, has been around for a very long time. There's even an organization dedicated to it called the SETI Institute. Um, but now we, now we use the word technosignatures, um, which themselves are a part of biosignatures. Uh, so biosignatures are any signs of life that we might find out there or even here on Earth. And then a technosignature is a form of biosignature that specifically shows us technological advancement, the creation of technology. Um, and how technology is used. And so you're right, we've been listening in the radio bands for a long time now, trying to see if anyone's communicating out there. Uh, there's lots of other ways though. M maybe alien life is sending signals as visible light. Uh, and so there's something called OSETI or optical SETI, where, where some astronomers are specifically looking for uh, perhaps worlds, you know, or even around stars where light is being flashed in some kind of interval to be sending signals that could be read. Uh, and maybe there's aliens out there that are trying to find other ways to communicate with us via EM radiation. Uh, maybe there's some really advanced ultra galactic species out there that's trying to use gravitational waves to send messages out. We just don't know yet. And so it's, it's worth opening our ears up to every kind of way of, of perceiving the universe to see what's being sent out. And then finally, there's this other, other realm, you know, that you mentioned, uh, that we talk about things like Dyson spheres. Mm -hmm. uh, or even you know, the idea of like, you know, the Halo games were very famous for, for popularizing an idea of a ring world uh, written by uh, Larry Niven was a very good science fiction novel called Ring World where he hypothesized this idea of, of having a large ring in the orbit of what would be a planet and in the inside of that ring you basically build you know, your entire world, your biosphere inside of the ring and, and it's possible that maybe we'll see you know, the, the dimming of a star 
that shows us some weird pattern that could be this. But it'd be really hard to tell right now. We don't quite, we're not quite there yet. So there's a star called Tabby star where we saw this, this regular, this repeating kind of dimming. It didn't seem to be like, you know, just the dimming of, of the planet itself, of the planet itself passing from the star. It was like this weird, like, you know, kind of fuzzy data signal of the dimming uh, of the star. And we couldn't tell, could, could that be a Dyson sphere, like a partial Dyson sphere around a star, uh, you know, letting some of the starlight through? Uh, and I think that the, the common idea now is that it's actually a bunch of, you know, debris, cometary material out around the star, like a large Oort cloud, maybe a very dense Oort cloud of its own that's kind of uh, hiding the light from that star. And so we're not quite sure yet how to tell the difference fully if we have, you know, a large, you know, realm of a sphere of rocky material around a star versus a Dyson sphere that's partially complete, uh, sending some messages. But I'm, I'm really glad that, that people are now funding this research. There's a lot more work being done there. Uh, there was a, re a recent uh, workshop hosted by my organization, Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, uh, and funded by NASA Exobiology uh, called Technoclimes, where the whole workshop was really trying to figure out, you know, what, what are we looking for for techno signatures? What will we find? How do we search for them? And, and right now, uh, starting uh, this week, there's going to be a series of seminars from NASA Goddard uh, on this topic of, of techno signatures and, and how we look for them uh, that I'm definitely looking forward to. Uh, the first one is this week. Uh, it's at 9 a.m. Uh, here, Mountain Time. Uh, my, my friend and colleague, Jacob Hawk Misra, will be talking about techno signature research. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot more going on right now in that realm that people are, are wondering, you know, will we find signs of intelligent alien life first? Will that be our, our first way of saying we're not alone by, by actually, you know, hearing a message or finding some sign of a, a Dyson sphere or will they you know, come swing by and say hi? Yeah, that would be the best option if they just come and swing by and say hello. So <laughs> well, I <laughs> maybe, right? <Yeah. laughs> we had a lot of very good science fiction that has you know, proposed to us what might happen if, uh, non-benevolent aliens come to visit the earth you know, maybe they would have want to, to, to devour our resources or life as we know it so it can be the two uh, you know one side can be they're happy to see us the other side is they lost all of their resources and they're trying to come and see us <laughs> I hope it's not yeah. the second one so yeah. just <laughs> just we, since we talked about Dyson so the Dyson civilizations maybe the listeners are not aware of it it's a different you know categories in the Dyson civilization categories well, so, uh, uh, so I think you're thinking of the Kardashev scale Kardashev scale yeah exactly. yeah so yeah so the, the Kardashev scale is a little bit different so um, so so Freeman Dyson what he had postulated was basically that we, we might find uh, infrared radiation coming off of these large spheres um, where uh, a civilization might have grown to the point of building a sphere around its entire solar system its entire star system to harness all of the energy of its parent star. And what he was proposing, if that was happening, then this large sphere, uh, this, this, this you know, you know, star system sized sphere with a star inside of it, uh, would be emitting infrared radiation. And so his argument in his original paper was, you know, shouldn't we also be then looking for potential alien life in infrared? Because if we see a point source of infrared, that appears to be a spherical sized structure emitting this, this infrared radiation, what it could be is a sphere absorbing all of the radiation from its parent star. And that's a really cool postulation. And that by itself then leads us into this next idea, which is the Kardashev scale. And so what Kardashev uh, hypothesized was this scale of different uses of energy for a civilization. Uh, and so his, his first, and, and there have been lots, lots of amendments to his scale over time, changes. But the very first idea is that a civilization, when it very first joins the Kardashev scale, it has used to learn, it has learned to use all of the energy of its world. Uh, so all of the energy coming from the star to the planet is being harnessed. Uh, this, this, this civilization is now a global civilization. Uh, we humans aren't there yet. We're not harnessing all the resources, all the energy available to us at the surface of our planet. There's still a lot more that we could be harnessing. But once we get there, once we start harnessing all this extra energy, and we basically have you know, turned our entire biosphere into a technological being of its own, uh, the next step 
would be the Dyson Sphere. It would be coming to harness all of the energy of our star system. And what that would look like, I mean, we don't quite know yet. Maybe it's building a Dyson Sphere out around it. Maybe it's, it's taking the sun and converting all of that energy into something that we can use for ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of possible things here, but it's coming to use the entire energy of a star system. But then what happens above that? Um, you know, th th there's a really beautiful science fiction uh, uh, work that I, I love a lot called Star Maker. Uh, it was written by Olaf Stapleton. Uh, I want to say in 1932, um, maybe 35. I, I, I don't quite have the date on hand, um, but it's a really good read. Uh, it's, a, it's a fictional story of what happens when a, a being, in this case, a human being, uh, leaves its world and takes on a galactic consciousness. And what I, I love in this story is, is Stapleton tries to postulate what happens when a galaxy itself has consciousness. You know, what, what happens at that level? And in Kardashev's scale, we come to this point where a civilization is basically harnessing all of the energy of a galaxy. And what kind of, what kind of civilization, what kind of being would that be? And, and is that a being? Is it an entity at that point of its own? Uh, what is it at that point? Uh, and then we have like this final scale of being like the, the omnipresent, the omniscient, the God form. Uh, what happens when a being is a universe in itself? Uh, and so, you know, we, we have some of the, there's, there's farther ends of the scale get a little silly for us right now to think about, but they're still important for us to consider. But what we do wonder is, is are, there, are there star systems out there where the entire star system itself really is a being? It is a, a Kardashev civilization. Uh, utilizing all of the energy from their, their parent star, or maybe if they're in a binary or trinary star system, their parent stars. Um, and what happens if we meet one of those, one of those beings or one of these civilizations? Um, what, what kind of communication would happen? That'd be like us trying to communicate with a microbe. Um, and so it's a, it's a very interesting thing to postulate. Yeah, exactly. Like um, Neil deGrasse Tyson puts it, you know, you don't want to, so there's a chance that they are there. They've seen us right but the upward evolution by two percent leads from monkey throwing bananas to throwing like rockets to the outside of the solar system almost and yeah. then they wouldn't like to ask us for movies right i would say because <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends it depends yeah. what they like um you know and so uh, uh neil actually just posted on twitter the other day that if he ever gets abducted by aliens the first thing he wants to ask them is whether or not so, some members of their society also deny science. And my, my response to that was, man, Neil, your, your priorities are in the wrong place. You know, if, if I get abducted by aliens, I have a lot more questions that come before some really intricate socio-political questions. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's a, another idea out there that I really like a lot. I, I haven't read the, the series of books by uh, Liu Si Chen yet, uh, but one of his novels is called The Dark Forest. And uh, this idea of the dark forest is what if, what if, you know, so, so say you're, you're a hunter and you're in a forest at night. Um, you don't know if there are tigers or, you know, other large you know, animals of, of prey or predators out in this forest. Um, but, but since you don't know, should you be very cautious about announcing your presence in the dark forest? And we humans are kind of in the same boat right now. We don't know if there are malicious alien civilizations out there. Um, we also don't know if there are alien civilizations out there for which the destruction of our biosphere would mean literally nothing to them. Uh, so maybe it's not even malicious or you know, a malicious intent. Maybe they just wouldn't even care if they destroyed our star, star system. Uh, maybe there are alien beings out there that are just so different from us that, that even though we would consider them life, they wouldn't consider us life. Maybe we're not important enough on their radar and they would simply come here and devour our planet. Since we don't know, we're kind of like the hunter right now or the, the person in the dark forest at night. And we don't know if there are any animals out there that, that might destroy us and want to eat us. So maybe we should be very, very cautious about announcing our presence just yet. Yeah, like Stephen Hawking, right? Before he, then he was alive, he was not a fan of <laughs> yeah, it's just throwing yeah, it there, out there, there. there. There's a group called Medi, uh, and, and you know, and, and there's wonderful people in this group. I'm, I'm not, I'm not judging their character or anything right now. Uh, Medi is messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, they've been arguing that we should be sending messages out, uh, and and like it or not, we have been. 
Uh, ever since we started broadcasting radio, we've been sending signals out into space. There's a small sphere of space around us, uh, about 100 light years, over 100 light years uh, in radius, full of signals being sent from the Earth of all of our transmissions that have been escaping our planet for a very long time. And we've also sent messages specifically. Uh, there's a very famous one called the Arecibo message uh, that was sent from Arecibo towards a star system, a, a globular star cluster, actually. Um, but there's also been other messages. Many, many themselves have been sending messages out. Uh, and there have been some other messages uh, in, intentionally sent into space, and we're likely going to have more. And so like it or not, we're already doing it. And so we really need to start getting prepared in case the, the, the alien life that's out there really doesn't have our best intentions uh, at play. Um, and honestly, we now have this issue of, of who gets to speak for Earth. You know, there's messages <laughs> going out now that maybe some of us don't want to be, you know, the signal that aliens get first about us. Uh, and honestly, there, there might be alien civilizations out there within that 100 light years or so uh, that have been picking up our messages and listening to them. And, and maybe they think that we're, we're not the best people to come be friends with right now because maybe they're receiving some of the messages, for instance, you know, through the, the World War II era and they're seeing some of the, the propaganda and the things that we were doing to each other. Maybe they're seeing some of our, our Cold War messaging uh, and some of the other sad things that we've done. So uh, that's rather unfortunate. But also, if we're going to start sending messages out, um, you know, who gets, to, who gets to decide what goes in those messages? Yeah, exactly. Like the, the one, one uh, ideology I remember somebody had was this sphere of radio that is going out, the signals is like a ticking bomb. You know, like his idea was we don't know when it's going to, this sphere, when it's going to hit dangerous species. So, mm -hmm. right. So we better yet be cautious of look, giving, you know, location of our solar system out too easy. <laughs> well, we have, we've had lots and lots of television shows and yeah. things like that that show where we are. <laughs> you know, I just don't want it to be like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and somebody shows up and says, hey, we are building a highway system. We sent you before. <laughs> we yeah. made you aware of it that, oh, the Earth should be disappearing right now because this highway system is passing through your solar yeah, system. It'd be a really sad fate for humanity if we, we, we caused our own destruction unintentionally because we weren't being more thoughtful about this. Now let's, let's come back to earth because that's out there. There's one thing I want to get into, then I'll get to artificial intelligence because that's also a very important subject to talk about. But so recently Pentagon, if you saw, they released the un un unidentified object since it's 2020, it didn't caught too much attention <laughs> because of the COVID-19 and all of crazy things that are going, people didn't see it too much. What do you think about that? Because that caused a lot of trouble, right? Even for scientists that we couldn't answer questions about it. Nope. We, yeah. Somebody asked me as an astronomer, what do you think? Like, I don't have the full understanding of the information they have. This is what the video is showing. Yeah. Is there any other things? You know, what do you think about it? That, that's actually a very interesting subject to talk about, I think. Yeah. Um, so those recent videos that were released were actually released long before. They were re-released. And um, I personally think that part of that was politically motivated because of 2020 and, and where things are at right now uh, in America with our economy and with the current presidential administration. Um, however, they, they're really interesting videos. You know, I've, I've watched them over and over again. Um, they are really weird objects, you know, and, and we don't know exactly what they are. Um, but here's the thing. Here's, here's the clincher. There's a lot of stuff that occurs in the sky that you can't explain. Uh, and you and I are scientists. Uh, and, and still, there's things that happen in the sky that we can't explain. But there's a lot we can. So, for instance, a lot of times people will see lights in the sky and have no idea what they are. But if they talk to someone, you know, who has a background in it, they, they, they get an explanation. For instance, light uh, shining off of airplane windows. Uh, we know that light does a lot of weird things in the heavens. Uh, makes a lot of weird uh, light displays for people to see uh, that can be very confusing. We also now, now know that a lot of uh, meteors coming down through the atmosphere, uh, these bits of, of ice grains and dust coming into the atmosphere, usually pretty high overhead, like 60 miles overhead, um, that they don't always come in a straight line. Sometimes due to the chemistry and how they're reacting and the burning up of the friction, they can come in and go sideways. They can make all kinds of jagged shapes uh, of lights in the, in the sky above. And so that's entirely possible. And so 
yet, as much as we can explain most of the things that some people would call UFOs, unidentified flying objects, there's still a lot we can't explain. There's still a decent number of things that I've even personally seen things in the night sky that I just cannot explain. Weird light patterns and motions uh, that just kind of seem bizarre. Uh, knowing as much as I do about science, I still can't explain it. And so, uh, and, and we now call those things UAPs, uh, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, which is a better word because UFO implies it's an actual object, a material object. But honestly, a lot of these things are displays of light and maybe they're not actual objects and we just don't know. Uh, and so it's worth exploring. And so my, my friend, uh, Jacob Hot Misra, I mentioned earlier, uh, he co-authored a recent article in Scientific American arguing that we really should be researching UAPs. And are they aliens? Maybe. That seems like the least likely answer, but maybe. And it's worth looking into. Are aliens visiting us right now? Or are they, they conducting tests and trying to figure out who we are? Maybe. Um, however, it doesn't seem likely. And I'll, I'll give you one really good logical reason why it doesn't seem likely. So say, say there is an advanced extraterrestrial species who have developed the technology to travel through interstellar space. So that by, the, by itself tells us they must be very, very, very way more advanced than we are uh, technologically. So they can travel between stars. They can come here. They've likely been around for a lot longer in the history of the universe. So their, their technology is way beyond ours. They have all this technological capability, and yet they come here, and they, they want to remain hidden for whatever reason. Uh, and I'm, I'm okay. Like, we might do the same thing. Maybe we'll travel to an alien world, and we'll choose to be hidden. Like in Star Trek, we'll have a prime directive that we don't interfere with another species until it, it reaches some level of technological capability um, before it's worth you know, saying, hi, we're here. We're, we're your neighbors. Maybe that's happening. Maybe aliens are visiting us and they don't want us to know that they're here. If that's the case though, and here's where, where, where you really have to start questioning the logic of these things being actual alien visitors and spaceships. If they traveled through interstellar space and they're way more advanced than we are, and they want to remain hidden, why are they so very bad at doing that? Why, why would, they, would they so easily allow themselves to be tracked by cameras on our jets? Why would, they, why would they allow themselves to be seen as light in the night sky? If they have all that technology and they want to remain hidden, why don't they have some cloaking device? Why, why, why can't they remain hidden if that's what they're, they're, what they're choosing to do? And if they can't do that, then why, why are they even trying? Why, why not just announce themselves already? Um, now, one interesting thing that's also worth pointing out that those recent two videos from, from the, uh, the, the Air Force that were released, uh, both of those videos came from the exact same kind of camera. And those two uh, features really could be something going on inside of the device itself. There's so many things we don't know. And so as a scientist, I think we should explore UAPs more and we should, we should actually figure out what's going on and maybe it will lead us to some new science. And honestly, as a nerd for alien life and science fiction and stuff like that, maybe it's aliens, even though I think it's probably not. Maybe that's also worth exploring because maybe we'll catch them and be like, hey, tell us why you're here, <laughs> you know? And so I think any way we go, it's worth, it's worth looking into more. Yeah, always you have to have this open mind uh, attitude because the problem also I see you know, people fall, scientists or non-scientists fall from the two sides of, you know, a big large mountain. They don't want to stay in the middle and keep their, you know, minds open. Either they become conspiracy theorists fully that, hey, we are abducted by aliens or or they're going to become pure science, you know, trying to narrow themselves down to something that is, don't even give, give a chance that there might be something extraordinary about this thing happening. So yeah. I think there's a spectrum and we've been seeing a lot of problems of like, whatever, whenever they see a radio wave, you know, the pulsars in the astronomy, when they started exploring them, they, they said, this is little green man. And we know in 19... At the beginning, when you know when they they were talking about Mars is attacking Earth, you remember all of those things. Mm -hmm. So it's always there, but I think you know there should be a put put this as the last option, but as an option that yeah. it can be actually something extraterrestrial. Yeah. Looking, I, I agree. Like it, it might be aliens, you know, like 
and it's worth looking into. So uh, an astronomer named uh, uh, Avi Loeb, uh, he, caught, he caught some flack from the science community themselves uh, not too long ago for suggesting that, that, that the interstellar object that flew into our solar system and is now screaming away from us, um, uh, Oumuamua, mm -hmm. uh, that this object might have been sent by an extraterrestrial uh, species or, or, or civilization. And a lot of astronomers, you know, they, they jumped on him right away and like, no, it can't be. It's not aliens. It can't be aliens. And, and the thing is, we don't know. We, we don't know if it's aliens or not. And so it's worth, it's worth proposing the hypothesis. It's worth proposing how we might test that hypothesis if we can uh, and, and, and thinking about it because maybe it is. Maybe it's aliens. Um, however, I think for everyone out there who loves this idea of you know, finding aliens, of alien visitation, all these kinds of things, like I'm with you. I love it too. It's awesome. I want to find aliens. I want to know we're not alone in the universe. I want to know that there's more going on. But just because we, we want to know about these things and like, you know, the, the famous X-Files poster, I want to believe, you know, I also want to know. And we're not going to know if we allow ourselves to so quickly uh, jump onto our favorite hypothesis. You know, we have to consider other potential uh, issues, which is why being skeptical and critical in your thought is always important. It's important to be open-minded, but to be skeptical. Yeah, so I always would say to people who are not kind of educated in science, right, in hard sciences, that we go through a lot of processes to say something is actually there, or because usually we go extremely against something at the beginning, always. You know, we never go and say, hey, I accept your idea. We're like, no prove me that your idea is correct. So we are ex being, I, I just wanna hear from you, for, what is your advice for lots of people, you know, that are looking into these things and fall into the trap of conspiracy theories, actually, right? That is out there, being alien, vaccines, all of those things, you know? So this is very important, I think, to talk about right now, just briefly, what kind of toolboxes they can have to not fall into the trap? I mean, well, science by itself, like the entire point of science, the entire endeavor of science, science is a tool and it's a tool to keep ourselves from being misled by, by fanciful beliefs. And the thing is, we humans, we so, we so want to believe, we so want to feel like we're part of something and we so want to, want to, to feel like we kind of know what's going on that it's so easy to find ourselves in these traps um, of believing in these conspiracy ideas. Uh, but science itself is a tool to stop that from happening. It's a tool to help us work with other people to come into an agreement about what we're, what we're observing, what we're seeing. Um, so maybe, you know, the color blue that I see isn't the same color blue someone else is seeing. But when we get together and we point the sky and we say, hey, the sky is blue, we both agree, yeah, the sky is blue. Um, that's kind of the beginning of this tool of us to, to, to have evidence, to make an observation, we have evidence, and then we can agree upon the evidence and we can have an, even, even go tell our friend, hey, go outside and look at the sky. What color is that? Like, oh, that's blue. Okay, cool. Like, we all agree. It's blue. Um, by, by working together, uh, we're far more likely to discover more about our place in the cosmos and what's going on around us. But it's always important to be skeptical. Um, there, you know, there's this idea that the best scientists should throw away their favorite pet hypothesis at least once a day just to make sure that they're also not allowing themselves to be led the wrong direction because scientists are also human and also make mistakes. They're also very likely to believe themselves. And so doubting ourselves is the beginning of allowing ourselves to be more open to understanding more, to be more skeptical. And so uh, there's a lot of ways for us to be more critical in our thinking, for us to determine more uh, of what's going on around us. Um, one is, is to, to, to always question anecdotal evidence. Uh, so, and, and, and honestly, an anecdote isn't evidence. Uh, so if someone has a personal story, that's, that's beautiful. And no one, no one doubts your story. I've had some very weird things happen in my own life. But we also have to know that like, we humans are very fallible in our memories. We're very likely to get things wrong. And there's a very good reason why uh, witness testimony is actually not valued as much as we we're, we're led to believe when it comes to courts and juries uh, and the court system. Uh, and especially, you know, with investigators, there's a reason why police officers and especially detectives are trained in how to find 
key key witnesses, uh, you know, witnesses who are more likely to be giving a good recounting of the story, because we are all really, really bad, it turns out, at remembering the specifics of things that happened to us. And we're very, very bad at, at keeping that memory for any period of time if we even have it in the first place. And so it's good to have ways to gain evidence that doesn't just rely on human experience. Um, to gain evidence that we, we all can take the same data uh, and then work together to make our own inferences from those data. Which is why the development of instrumentation for, for measuring things about the, the world around us has been so crucial to the sciences. It's allowed us to make our own interpretations of the data and then to come together and to debate over those interpretations. That doesn't mean that experience isn't important. There's, there's a very beautiful place for experiential learning. Uh, even though I'm a scientist, uh, I'm also a longtime martial artist and I meditate a lot and I find a lot of value to experiential learning and to, to the feeling of being alive and being present in space around me. Um, but that learning is a lot different. That realm of human understanding is a lot different than science. Yeah, so the, 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 the point I just wanted to say to the listeners is don't think that scientists are actually, you know, very firm on their ideas and they believe on when they get to say this theory looks like it's correct, they literally spend one week proving it, two weeks disproving it, one mm -hmm. week, two, you know, maybe twice more. So you sh I think people should, you know, when they read something or they see any evidence out there that looks like a conspiracy, the best way would be to sit and think on themselves, you know, go against it as much as they can. And if it's still they're convinced, then that's another story, you know, but it, 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 I'm just saying it should be repetitive, evidential. Now, yeah. doubt, doubt is the beginning of learning, really. Yeah. And you have to doubt yourself. Uh, so Descartes, when he sat down to his meditations, the very first thing he wanted to do was doubt everything. And he failed utterly because the very first thing he said he wouldn't do was doubt the existence of the God that he believed in. But that by itself means that he, he could not remove that doubt. And so he wasn't. He wasn't able from the very beginning to, to, to use doubt. And that's unfortunate. Um, had he really gone, gone the whole way and doubted everything, um, maybe he would have come to even more than just, I think, therefore I am. Yeah, exactly. Now we get to the realm of kind of, I want to go back on earth from you know, the sky. So we, here on earth, we are working on intelligence for years, right? It's nothing new. We are trying to understand what is actually intelligent means, what is consciousness? I don't want to get to that. That's like a, maybe it will need another four hours to talk about what's consciousness, right? But do we have, you know, since we are working on artificial intelligence, right? Is it a possibility that when we get to artificial intelligence being that is as intelligent as us at least, right? That is going to give us a sign, hey, look, this is, this is another way of actually approaching a being you know, or life. What do you think about it, you know, from oh. your point of view? Yeah, and so, we, you know, this idea of artificial intelligence, we also might call it post-biological life. Um, so, so life that has come after the biology part, the, <clears throat> the general chemistry, organic chemistry, and is now built on the intelligence from that earlier biological life. And it seems likely, I mean, in our machine learning systems are getting better and better and better. Artificial intelligence is already in the works. And it's, it's very likely that not only human level artificial intelligence is going to be here very soon, but that super intelligent AI is on the way. Uh, super intelligent AI would be an artificial intelligence that's even smarter than us, even more intelligent, even more capable. And there's good and bad about that. Um, that intelligence might destroy us. You know, it's, it's possible we, we might not have control over that super intelligent AI. Um, or we might mess up and code it wrong. Uh, Nick Bostrom, the philosopher, for instance, made this really awesome proposal um, of what happens if we're, we're, we're so direct in how we train the AI that it does its job too well. And he used the example of the paperclip game um, or the, the paperclip. Uh, so what happens if we tell a super intelligent AI that its job is to make paper clips. And that's, that's its only job, is just get really good at making paper clips. And that's all we tell it. And we, we don't give it enough other programming for it to understand boundaries, um, or it to learn how to control itself, or to be you know, at all rational in how it's, how it's doing this. 
uh, maybe that AI would start producing paper clips and realize it needs better machinery, better technology to make paper clips, so it does that. Maybe it needs more economy and resources, and so it figures out how to run the economy and, and take over the economy and make everyone on Earth start becoming a zombie whose job is to make paper clips. Maybe it wants to destroy all humans and make more robots to make paper clips. What happens if it, if it gets so overrun with itself, it starts devouring all the resources of the universe to make paper clips. And so someone uh, uh, took this idea and coded a really fun game you can play on, a, on an internet browser uh, called the paperclip game, where you can basically be this artificial intelligence making paperclips, and you can basically destroy the universe. Uh, you can take all of the energy, all the mass of the universe, and eventually just turn it on the paperclips for whatever reason. Um, that may happen, but we also, so we have to be thoughtful. Um, and we also have like uh, uh, Isaac Asimov, he wrote uh, the iRobot uh, novel and this series of stories in the iRobot realm. He had this idea of the three laws of robotics. And one of the issues that I take with these three laws is that a lot of people in our modern day keep using them as an example of how we might control AI. But in Isaac Asimov's stories, the whole point of the robot laws, these three laws of robotics, was that the laws will always fail because they, they were, they were, there was always too much gray area. It was never you know, black or white, I follow these laws exactly. It was always that there were so many ways that these laws might not work that the robots themselves end up having all these issues occur. And that's a problem. We need to be thoughtful in how we, how we start coding AI before we allow the AI to start coding itself. Mm. Before we give it the chance to start taking over itself and saying what it wants to do, and having that agency for itself, we should be really thoughtful about how we introduce a level of humanism and thoughtfulness to this AI, because otherwise we might be destroying ourselves. So remember, I remember a couple of years ago, they asked, somebody asked me, do you think we'll get to super intelligence? I was like, I don't think so back then I answered, but two years, three years ago, there were two famous articles actually being published by Richard Sutton He's like the, you know, one of the very famous reinforcement learning uh, people. And then the other one from Jeff Klon from Uber back then, he was a scientist that they took the, a new approach on creating. That scared me, you know, the new, the new way to going toward artificial intelligence, so starting from a seed AI and using computation and a lot of data and let the AI figure out how he wants to become better, you know, at some stuff. So that can give a, that can give us a kind of a zoo of intelligence that we've never experienced before, like evolutionary intelligence, but in the in, inside. And that's dangerous because it's black box inside black box inside black box inside black box. So you're right. On one sense, it's extremely dangerous, like exactly, you know, telling universe that we exist and where we are. This is another very dangerous thing. But if we put enough money and enough resources to do AI safety, Prehend, and if we get to super intelligence, that's going to be fascinating. If he's a friend of us, yeah. Right? And honestly, may, maybe for better or for worse, um, maybe it won't be a bad thing for us to eventually no longer exist and to be replaced by AI. May, maybe part of maybe that's a, a natural process for life. That life begins on a world, it evolves to a point where it develops a level of intelligence that allows for the creation of technology. Uh, and then maybe through that technology, uh, a new form of life is created, this post-biological life, that eventually makes it no longer necessary to have the biological life anymore. And that sounds very sad uh, for us, especially since that means we wouldn't be around, um, but maybe that is the natural process. Um, and, and so, Maybe, you know, all the aliens out there really are post-biological life forms. And the reason we haven't met them yet is because they're waiting for us to make AI so they can have a conversation with, with the super intelligent AI to come after us. Yeah, there, there are like other ways of, you know, thinking about it. People think we may become combined with them, you know, like the cyborg idea in all of the science fiction novels. that Or like the, the brain in the machine, you know, human machine interfacing, um, which means that the AI would be us. Uh, so it's not a bad thing. It is the continuation of us. One, one, one place that I worry a lot in this realm, uh, so you might have heard recently, uh, Jeff Bezos just became the first human being 
to overcome $200 billion worth of net worth. Um, and we have all these, you know, these multi-billionaires now on this planet. Um, with the coming future, who knows what will happen with, you know, ec economics and resources. But we're not likely to break through this huge dichotomy in wealth. The wealth inequality on Earth is not likely to change anytime soon. Uh, where most human beings are rather poor, and then there's a very small number of human beings who are extremely wealthy, and those human beings tend to be in control of a lot of our governmental systems, our companies, our organizations. Uh, their children end up becoming politicians and, and regulators. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's, that's the case right now. We don't have a way to, eat, to, to make it more equal uh, with our current systems. Uh, without large-scale revolutions and some other things occurring. And so one of the biggest worries I have right now is that most likely the earliest human-machine interfaces aren't going to be for everyone. It's going to be the very wealthy. And so there was a really beautiful movie called Transcendence with Johnny Depp that kind of explored this, this happening where the very first person is this, you know, there's this wealthy, very, very technological savvy man who puts himself into a computer and he becomes the first AI, and then he transcends everything. Um, but you know, some of these wealthy billionaires, they might not be the person we want to speak for the rest of us. Maybe we don't want their consciousness to be the first one that becomes the only consciousness of AI. And so we should be prepared for that as well. But how do we, how do we, how do we argue to make sure that when human consciousness becomes AI, if that happens, that it's a sampling of human consciousness and not just one individual who might then choose to use that AI for their own gain. Yeah, that, that would be a terrifying, <laughs> right? But, yeah, but, I mean, it's, and I, I don't mean to sound bleak here and everything. It's just, these are important things for us to think about. There's also a lot of beauty in it, but it's important for us to consider uh, these existential threats that we do face because of our technology, because of our place in the cosmos. Yeah, the thing is like uh, one thing I always say for physicists, this is, you know, we understand it very clean and clear back in when the you know, nuclear bomb was being created. So many physicists were in doubt that such a thing would exist till the first bomb exploded. Right. And, and I am become death, destroyer of worlds. <laughs> yeah. So, but the problem with super intelligent, putting it as the next stage of evolution without being too careful is that if it suddenly it can happen without we even being, we even not noticing it, it's happening because it's like a nuclear war right now, like a cold war between gigantic tech companies. They want to get to it faster and quicker than anyone because if somebody gets to a not even super intelligent call it an intelligent ai they can dominate everything on the earth right yeah. and, and not just tech companies also government agencies there are there are, there are things going on at the national level with the military where i mean our military the chinese military the north korean military there's the russians there, there's a lot of groups who have a lot of interest right now in getting their military up to snuff with intelligent ai first because they're worried of what happens if others get there before us. And as Nick Postromi puts it, that's a disaster because nobody thinks of safety first, right? Oh, you know, we're just yeah. going toward it without knowing what we are going toward. You know, it's like and the safety bottom problem. That, that level of tit for tat. I mean, we, we in, 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 in what happened during the Cold War with the United States government and the, and the Soviet Union government, uh, and just the, the massive proliferation of nuclear warheads, tens upon tens of thousands of nuclear warheads developed. And, and there's been research showing that it would only take a very small number of large cities to be nuked for us to have total nuclear fallout on Earth for quite some time. Um, and yet we developed so many of these warheads in this going back and forth, this tit for tat, racing to see who can, who can you know, amass the most devastational warfare, the most you know, obliterating capability and if we're going to do the same thing now with AI and some of these other technologies, like, and just race to get it as fast as we can without thinking about what we're doing to ourselves, it's a travesty upon all of humanity and our biosphere for us to do this um, without thinking through it, which is part of why I argue that we, we need not just more, uh, more training and education and philosophy for young people globally, but we also need more training in empathy 
and compassion and thinking about ourselves and each other. Yeah, exactly. Because if we don't do that, then, then the, when, they, when they are racing toward this, uh, you know, in young minds as a part of this kind of, this kind of research, they wouldn't know what is the outcome because they, you, you just, it's, it's the nature of human being, right? You get uh, lost when you are very excited about doing something and you're, not, you're so narrow-minded to achieve it in that moment that you don't think, wait a second, if I achieve it, what's going to happen afterward? That, that, because we are messing with evolution, literally. This is right. like evolving to the next level without thinking too much. You know, I just say, look at the species that disappeared on Earth because we were better than them. Yeah. Now you want to put something that may become better than us and you, you know what can happen because what you did to the environment as an intelligent being. Yeah, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, potential ways to define intelligence. And David Grinspoon, a fellow astrobiologist and friend, um, he has a book called Earth in Human Hands. It's a, a very good read about the Anthropocene and what we're doing right now to ourselves. Uh, he's argued that, that maybe intelligence doesn't actually happen until a species or a biosphere is capable not only of realizing its, its own behaviors and how it's impacting the biosphere and the world on which it lives, um, but maybe that, that, that switch to intelligence happens when a species is finally capable of actually acting for its own good to fix or to, to work on that, that world, that biosphere. So maybe we're not there yet. Maybe we're actually not intelligent yet. And that's why aliens haven't come to see us. Maybe they're waiting to see us start uh, fixing our own messes and cleaning up our pollution and start seeing us uh, fixing our own world for ourselves. And so maybe they're waiting for that. And then, like I mentioned earlier, maybe they're also waiting to see artificial intelligence. Maybe, maybe that is the next step. Maybe post-biological life is so common that other life doesn't want to talk to us until we're there. Yeah, that is a, that is a fascinating way of thinking about it. <laughs> so now I just uh, want to ask about also Blue Marble, since mm -hmm. you're, you know, for our listeners, what do you guys work on there? Like Everything. Uh, so Blue Marble Space uh, is a nonprofit organization that serves kind of like an umbrella organization uh, with several initiatives inside of it. Um, all these initiatives are started by scientists who have different passions, different interests in the world. And then Blue Marble Space as a nonprofit is the host uh, of all these initiatives. And so we have SaganNet, um, which is an, uh, a social network for astrobiologists and astrobiology enthusiasts. Uh, we have SciWorthy, which is a science news site uh, that basically reports recent research uh, and is developing a podcast to share recent research in general language with everyone. Uh, we have Green Space, which is an indoor microgreen farm, growing microgreens in Pennsylvania. Uh, we sell them online. Uh, and then also using some of that money that we're, we're, we're bringing in from, from selling these microgreens and growing uh, this wonderful food source for people, uh, some of that money then goes to research on how we can grow microgreens in space, uh, on Mars and other places, how we, how we can use uh, growing our own food in space for the future of humankind. Uh, and then we also have the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, which is our research branch for which I'm a research scientist. Uh, we have 60 scientists as of right now in our organization who are working on myriad problems in astronomy and geology uh, in physics and computer science, biology, all kinds of realms. Um, we have an economist in our, in our, in our group. Uh, many of us are also science communicators. Uh, we're doing all kinds of work uh, on studying astronaut health, on studying the history of the evolution of life on Earth, uh, the earliest geological phases of our planet, uh, on studying who's going to govern Mars. And so when I, when I say we're doing everything, I, I really do mean it. We are doing a bit of everything. Um, we're even, some of us are even interested in the social sciences, humanities, uh, in philosophy, and so we're working in a lot of different realms at the Marble Space Institute of Science. That's interesting. It should be very fun to have interdisciplinary discussions every day. It really is, yeah. So I want to go back to you, Graham. How did you get interested in science? What happened that Graham one day morning woke up and said, I want to become an astrobiologist when I yeah. grow up? <laughs> well, so my science story uh, starts at five. When I was five years old, uh, my parents took me to see a movie that had just come out in the movie theaters in America. Uh, it was very famous in that year. 
and it was called Young Einstein. It was made by uh, an Australian man named Yahoo Sirius. Uh, he changed his name to Yahoo Sirius. Uh, he also famously, back in the early 2000s, tried to sue uh, Yahoo over name infringement, even though uh, that didn't work out. He, he wasn't using his name for any, any commercial gain, and he also he got the name from uh, uh, Gulliver's Travels. Um, but it was a, it's a, a comedy movie uh, with a lot of rock and roll music in it, uh, telling a fictitious story of a young Albert Einstein growing up in Tasmania as an apple farmer who learns to split the Tasmanian beer at him to put bubbles in his beer. And so the whole movie is, is a hilarious journey of this, this Albert Einstein trying to patent his beer formula. Uh, and along the way, he meets other scientists and thinkers, but it had like a lot of just really fun little poignant moments um, about science, about relativity, um, and about Albert Einstein. And it was just kind of a, a wacky, fun way to explore a fictitious retelling of a scientist's life. And even though I was five, I, I already loved a lot of science. I, I'd read a lot by that point already. I read a bunch about Albert, Albert Einstein and other scientists. And I remember I, I went home that night and I did two things. Uh, one, uh, because of the music in, in the movie, and I, I love that like in the movie, the character makes his own guitar. Uh, I went home that night and I made my very first guitar. Uh, and this, you know, that's 32 years ago and I, I still play guitar almost every day. Um, it's still a huge passion of mine is to play and, and make music. Um, and it's a, a huge release for me in my life. Uh, but then the second thing that happened is that that night I told my mother I wanted to be a scientist um, because of this movie. Um, and even though, yes, it was a fictitious movie, it wasn't really science. It was, it was presenting science in a fun, uh, humanizing way. I think because of that, it really, it made me think, man, you know, it'd be cool to be a scientist and think about big things. Think about why are we here? What is the nature of the universe? How does the universe work? What are the laws that control everything around us? And what more can we learn about the universe? But then it also made me think, you know, well, well can we have some fun while doing it too? Can we also be a little wacky, a little zany, a little groovy? Can we kind of, can we kind of have fun while being scientists? And so, that, that kind of set me on my journey of becoming a scientist. And there was, you know, a lot of, a lot of stops along the way, a lot of detours, a lot of trouble, but also a lot of beautiful experiences, meeting a lot of great people and a lot of discovery. So for the listeners who are young, ambitious, what is your advice if they are, if they are trying to pursue science in general? Yeah, uh, I have a few pieces of advice. Uh, first of all, question everything. Uh, you don't have to have a PhD or even a bachelor's degree to be a scientist. Being a scientist is about thinking scientifically. It's about questioning everything. It's about doubting yourself, um, at least sometimes, to allow you to be more open-minded, to really think about what's possible. Uh, now, if you do want to have a career in the sciences, then you should go to school to study. And so it'll be important to learn about mathematics and the history of science, the philosophy of science, how science works and why it works, uh, and then to, to study something that you're passionate about. Uh, try, try to find questions. You know, science is about asking questions, and it's about being, being careful in choosing our questions and being humble in how we accept those answers, and those answers will often lead us to more questions. And so you know, be willing to, to explore a little bit and find out what drives you. If you really are curious about the sciences, but you don't know what science you want to study, then that's okay. Study them all. Uh, start off just like look, look into a little bit of biology, look into some chemistry, look into some physics, look into some astronomy, uh, look into some geology, see, see what, really, what really you get passionate about. Uh, if, if you go out for a hike and you see a weird rock and you get passionate about that, maybe there's a geoscientist inside of you. If you go outside at night and look at the stars and, and you wonder, you know, is there more out there with the stars to know? Maybe there's an astronomer inside of you. Um, if you wonder you know, how life works, then maybe you're a biologist. But you can also be all of these things. Uh, in school, I studied biology, chemistry, astrophysics, and geology because I, I couldn't get enough of everything. I, I loved everything. I wanted to know more and more and more. And that's part of what led me to becoming an astrobiologist too, is just learning all these different things and how all these different sciences work. Uh, and then finally, it's very helpful to find a good teacher. Uh, I learned this very well in the martial arts as a young person. 
Uh, and this happens in everything you do in life. If you want to learn how to meditate, find a good teacher. If you want to learn the martial arts, find a good teacher. If you want to learn how to read better, find a good teacher. If you want to learn how to play the guitar, find a good teacher. There's a lot of things you can learn on your own, a lot of self-discovery that we have. Uh, but having a good mentor, a good teacher, someone in the world to help you is very important because they've already been down the road a little bit. And so they, they can give you some of their experience along the way. Uh, the human endeavor of learning is never done inside of a black box. It's not done inside of a vacuum. It's done as a community. We're, we're all learning together all the time. And if you have a good teacher, they, they can take you where they are and take you at your lower place and kind of move you up to where they are a little faster. They help you level up. And then you can start going beyond them and start asking your own questions. A good mentor isn't just somebody who has a degree. It isn't just somebody who's, who's paid to be your teacher. It's somebody who actually cares, who listens to you, and who challenges you. A good mentor, a good teacher, they, they shouldn't just you know, look at your work and say, oh, good job. Uh, they should look at your work and say, this is good, but here's how you can do better. And here's what I would recommend you do to get better. And here are some tools you can use to get better. That's a good mentor. That's a good teacher. They will listen to you. They will be there for you when you have questions and they will challenge you to be the best part of yourself you can be. So where can people search for these kind of mentors? That is also, you know, this came to my mind to ask yeah. you. Yeah, it's a very good question because it can be difficult to find, you know, like for, for uh, an undergraduate student looking for graduate school work. You know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of times graduate students talking about their graduate advisors, the person who helps them on their graduate research to become a PhD or a master's degree uh, student uh, as being their mentor. But sadly, too often, graduate school advisors are actually not very good mentors because they're never taught how to be mentors. They're never taught how to be teachers. Uh, you'll see that a lot in graduate schools uh, where the mentors, as they're supposed to be, are really just advisors who don't really know how to do a great job of it. And that's unfortunate, and it can be fixed. We can teach people how to teach. We can teach ourselves how to teach. We can get better at this. Uh, and so to find a good mentor, an important thing is to see uh, other people that they've mentored before. Uh, so speak to other people who've been inspired by this person, who've learned from this person, who've been in this person's life. Um, and if there's you know, a person out there who has huge celebrity, that doesn't mean you shouldn't reach out to them and still ask them questions. I get questions all the time from students from around the world and I can't be their mentor, unfortunately, because I just don't have the time, but I'm happy to answer their questions and maybe point them in the right direction for other people who can be their mentors. Uh, when you want a mentor in your life, think about the kinds of things you want to be. Who do you want to be down the road? And then who out there in, you know, in the entire world is already kind of in that position or in as a similar position that can help you become the person you want to be. And those are good people to reach out to. Even though a lot of us get very busy. I mean, I get each day hundreds and hundreds of messages and emails. And sometimes I, I feel bad, but I can't answer them all. Sometimes I just have to delete a bunch of them for my own, my own safety, my, my, my own mental health. I have to just go through and delete things. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't answer your email the first time, send another one. If I don't answer it that second time, send another one. It's okay. Maybe, maybe I will get time to answer. Uh, and if I don't, maybe reach out to me on social media and I'll try to answer it. Uh, and the same thing goes for many other people out there in the world who might be the best mentor for you. Even if they can't be your mentor, they might know people you can reach out to. So reach out to them in the first place. So I remember from my case, myself and you know, I was a kid looking to know more about stuff. My mom said something that always sticks in the back of my brain. He said, I asked, who can I, who can I ask my questions from? How can I learn more about, more about stuff? He said, get a library card. <laughs> so like we live in a, you know, unfortunately there are two sides, side effects of like the social world build up. Like people are relying a lot on the social world and learning things. But there is another way of fully approaching it was being isolated on your own on books, you know, like because they, they are written by experts, although they are not alive. You can get advice from, I don't know, the best philosophers in the world, the best scientists ever existed, right, in the universe. Yeah. Then when you scaled up, you can ask, because now you, you, you kind of, you know their language. Now you can go talk to people to become your mentor. I think there is always a, 
You know, it's like a train, right? My advisor in California used to put it this way. As soon as the train takes a lot of force to start moving, right? But then it starts moving, there is no force that can stop that train. So it, it just keeps, this is how I think of like mentorship. You want a, a mentor that teach you how to do it from book or from out, out the world. Mm -hmm. Now, Graham, I want to get to, because in, in people's ideas, opinions, scientists are nerds sitting in their offices, <laughs> closed, closed, uh, closed doors, not doing any activities. What do you do besides science when you are not <laughs> doing science? Yeah, lots of things. Um, so I already mentioned that I play guitar. Um, I also play didgeridoo. Um, I, I love the didge. Um, I also write a lot. Uh, so... Um, you know, being a scientist, being anything in the world, learning the skills of reading and writing and communicating are so crucial. Uh, you have to learn how to learn. And so uh, I highly advise anyone, like, get good at reading. Read everything. Read books, read magazine articles, newspapers, you know, websites all the time. Read everything. Try to read a lot. And try to learn how to read better. Um, there, there are ways to read uh, faster and with more comprehension that will help a lot in, in being a good reader. Uh, writing. Writing is a skill you have to use all the time to improve at it. And so I, I would recommend to everyone to write a lot. And for me, a, a nice release is writing science fiction stories. Uh, and also, I write poetry sometimes for fun too. Uh, it's nice to write just to kind of to hit that artistic valve and let go a little bit. Um, I, do, I do like creating, even though most of my, my, my artwork these days is graphic design. Uh, I like Affinity Designer. It's a great, it's a great program for designing uh, artwork and graphic design. So I do a lot of that just for fun um, because I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, and then I, I love reading uh, lots of science fiction stories and stuff like that, things like that kind of keep going. Um, and I love watching a lot of science fiction television shows and movies and stuff and playing video games. Uh, right now, my wife and I are re-watching Westworld, uh, which is it's, it's a fantastic show. Um, I just found out recently that the creators of the Westworld show on HBO are now working on a new series where they're going to take Michael Crichton's uh, Sphere novel and movie and turn that into a television show, which I think is going to be fantastic. Uh, I've also heard great things about the new series Away on Netflix, so I'll be watching that soon. Uh, yeah, there's lots of ways, lots of outlets out there for creativity and for just being involved in the world around you. Uh, and then I'd say my, my last big thing is being outdoors. Um, if I don't sleep outside in a tent or in a hammock uh, at least every few months, uh, I start to just feel really not human anymore. Uh, I need to get outside and hike and bike and surf and, and sleep outside. And I love mountains. I love oceans. I love forests. Just being out in, in the wilderness, I think, is, is just beautiful. Especially at this time when, you know, it's COVID-19 time. That you, can, yeah. you can use outdoors a lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So as the last question, I usually ask this from every guest, what is your most favorite book? It's very hard to answer. I understand the book that you opened and when you closed, you went, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> and so like I, like I said, I, I do read a lot. I really love a lot of books. There's a lot of great science books out there. Uh, Cosmos is a great read from Carl Sagan. Even today, some of the numbers have changed a little bit. We've we got some more science now. Some, some things have changed, but, uh, Cosmos is great. His other books, Pale Blue Dot, uh, is beautiful. Demon Haunted World is beautiful. Uh, also, Chris Simpe's uh, uh, Living Cosmos is also a really great introductory book for astrobiology and learning more. Um, however, all of that said, I mean, I, I love these books. I love Carl Sagan's works. Um, there's a lot of other things I love in science writing. Um, but for me, I think my most favorite book is Dune. Uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. Uh, I've never read anything from his son, Brian Herbert, in the, the, the extended universe, but I've read Frank Herbert's Dune series, uh, all of his books on Dune, uh, many times over in my life. And Dune itself, my, my original copy of Dune, I read it so many times that the entire book is basically falling apart and obliterated. Uh, I still have it because it means a lot to me sentimentally, um, but I actually have to buy a new copy of it just so I can read it. And I, I would say I read Dune once a year. Uh, maybe sometimes more than that, but usually once a year I, I will read Dune. And for me, even as a young kid reading this book, and I, I loved the movie in the 80s. I loved the, the miniseries for Dune and Children of Dune that Sci-Fi Channel put out many years ago. 
Uh, I'm very glad there's a new a new Dune movie coming out from Denis Villeneuve, Villeneuve here soon. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it. Frank Herbert created in in the novel Dune a universe that has been you know just so special for me because Dune made me think more about this idea of like planetary scale ecology. How would an ecologist approach an alien world? You know, and for me as a kid reading that, like it really made me like want to be that planetary ecologist and learn more. But I also love that he brings in all these other ideas of politics and, and business, uh, you know, these secret societies like the Bene Gesserit um, and, and what happens with the human being if the human being can, can transcend our physical state as it is now. And we see that in the main character of Paul Atreides. And so, uh, so for me, I would say my most favorite book, hands down, is Dune. Thank you so much, Graham. I appreciate for being here and uh, giving us your time. Yeah, thank you.